Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Vinay Bharadwaj. I am a doctor. I actually work on the uh, research and development team for a company, GrowFit. And uh, the reason I'm here today is uh, with uh, the blessings of the uh, Kilter team, I thought it would be kind of fun to share with you some of the research that we've been doing right here in Bangalore for the last year. So um, we have been looking into something called insulin resistance, which is very uh, much related to that uh, discussion that we were having earlier over here in the corner. So I thought what would be useful for everyone is a bit of background and a bit of an education on the core concepts behind insulin resistance so that in the future you understand what these terms are, you understand what we're talking about, and you can also understand the experimental data a little bit uh, more easily. So core concepts first. So I think most of us have heard of a hormone or a protein called insulin. Uh, it's made in our bodies. It can be given to diabetics. It seems to be related to blood sugar. Uh, most of uh, most patients or most uh, people that I talk to, they tend to know that insulin tends to bring your blood sugars down. And most diabetics will say, my, my doctor raised my uh, dosage of insulin because my sugars were too high. My doctor lowered my dosage because I was getting hypoglycemic. So insulin and blood sugar are kind of interrelated. So uh, to teach you a little bit about what this interrelation is, uh, this is an insulin molecule here, or at least a, a, a stylized one. And this could be any cell in your body. It could be a liver cell. It could be a muscle cell. It could uh, uh, be pretty much anything. What insulin does is it connects to these cells and allows the sugar that's in your bloodstream, that's outside the cell, to get inside. That's one of its primary functions. That is its primary function. It acts like a gatekeeper. It acts like a key. And once you put that key into that lock, you will have the movement of sugar. Wherever that sugar came from, it could have came from what you ate or it could come from stored sources, but that glucose, that sugar, will get funneled into these cells. So that's the primary function of insulin, and we know that insulin and blood sugar are related. So the next thing that many of us uh, know about is the fact that people who are taking insulin, especially those uh, of you who are advanced diabetics, people who are taking insulin tend to have a lot of side effects due to the insulin alone. Insulin has a lot of other functions in the body that we don't tend to think of. And one of the important ones is the fact that it increases your body's desire to grow. Tissues tend to grow. Insulin helps adipose tissue grow. Insulin helps soft tissues grow. It helps your bones grow. Insulin is very important around puberty for the general growth of children. So insulin is not necessarily a bad thing, but what you do notice is that people who are on a lot of insulin or people who make a lot of insulin on their own, they tend to gain weight. And the sad fact of the matter is, even if you're trying to diet and you're a diabetic and you're on insulin, even if you're trying to cut back on calories, you, there's data to show that you'll still gain weight. And there are so many studies that show these different drugs. Drugs that tend to force your body to make more insulin are the drugs that tend to have the side effect of gaining weight. Whereas the drugs that sensitize you to insulin, which is a term we'll talk about in a little bit, those actually tend to help you lose weight for the most part. So in understanding the metabolic importance of insulin is very important. So this slide, the main reason I wanted to put it here is I wanted to reiterate the equilibrium or the dynamic equilibrium between your blood sugar levels and your insulin levels. When your blood sugar tends to rise, your insulin levels tend to rise. When your uh, blood sugar levels fall, your insulin levels tend to fall, and vice versa. They are in a dynamic equilibrium, and it's very important we know what our insulin levels are. And it's very important that we understand that these levels can change throughout the entire day. I mean, they'll definitely change in and around meals. That's easy enough. Uh, in, uh, basal flow of insulin will change quite drastically when you're asleep. Uh, around that 2 or 3 a.m. window. So that dynamic equilibrium is very important to understand because what we're beginning to understand is the, 
the, the damage or the ruining of this dynamic equilibrium is what takes you down the road to terms like metabolic syndrome, diabetes, PCOS, and all of those kinds of things. So, uh, to dig a little deeper, what is giving us this equilibrium? What is, what is the process that is helping us uh, maintain this balance between how much sugar we have in our blood, how much glucose we have, and how much insulin we have? Now, this slide is intentionally dense because I don't want you to look at it. All right, the only thing I may want you to look at is this thing called an insulin receptor. That's where all this magic is happening. But in the interest of time, I thought an analogy would be a little better to understand this process rather than biochemistry. So, have, you, have any of you ever been in the traffic in Bangalore? Uh, you must have uh, gone in traffic at some point or another. So, I've been here for about five years. It's been an amazing journey for me. I started dri I want, I, I'm a typical American. I wanted to start driving as soon as I got here. And, you know, I was in traffic. I was at a place near uh, South End Circle, and there's this guy. There's a red light in front of me, and there's this guy behind me honking away to glory. Get out of my way. Honk, 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 honk. And I'm like, dude, light's red. What do you want me to do? And so the thing is, the, 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 the the message is there. That guy wants me to get out of the way. And I was listening. He was getting a response from me. Not the response he wanted. I didn't move. But he was getting a response. Cut to five years later. I'm at South End Circle. There could be an elephant, three circuses, a lorry, air horns, and a parade going behind me. I don't give a damn anymore. I am totally resistant to the signals happening behind me. After years and years of listening to that honking, after years and years of listening to that cacophony, I become resistant to that signal. And I want you to imagine a similar dynamic between insulin and your blood sugar. Your insulin receptors tend to ignore the signal coming from insulin if the insulin is there all the time. If your insulin uh, levels are constantly high, if you're always having these sugary foods and your insulin levels are always being spiked, your insulin receptors that are very important, that are present in your liver, in your muscles, and all the metabolically active cells in your body, these guys, they get bored. They stop listening. They become the guy who's not going to listen when you honk at them. So, this is how I want you to imagine insulin resistance. Uh, that's not exactly how it works, but uh, to give you a, a slight picture into how we think it works, to give you a slight picture into what we're doing in our lab, we're focusing very much on this little part of your liver cell or of your muscle cell called the mitochondrion. Um, I don't know how much you guys remember of your high school chemistry, but uh, yeah, the mitochondrion, uh, it's got some fascinating evolutionary history behind it, but the mitochondrion is the power source of the cell. Most of the energy that your cells make comes from here. And these, this is the place where, disease, where metabolic diseases like PCOS, like diabetes, this is where the problems happen. So understanding the chemistry here, understanding the biochemistry here is very, very important. But I, again, I, I'm not going to bore you with everything, but one thing we do want to look at is what's happening inside the mitochondrion and what are some of the side effects of normal metabolism. So... Imagine this is the wall of the mitochondrion. I, I, I'm really sorry, this looks really technical, but I don't really, really need you to look in detail uh, here or know these reactions. I just want you to imagine that you're inside a mitochondrion, and there's a lot of energy coming out of this thing called the TCA cycle. We have a lot of different uh, terms for this, but we can, we, it doesn't really matter. Energy made here. Along with this energy, we get things called free radicals. Um, reactive oxygen species, all these fun terms for oxygen molecules that have gone bad, for oxygen molecules that one electron is flipped and now they want to react with everything. They want to oxidize everything in the environment. Now these free radicals, we may have heard about these free radicals for a while. Some companies actually sell antioxidant fortified uh, 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 stuff like that. That's all a bunch of BS, by the way, but anyway. Uh, so insulin resistance is actually moderated by the free radical output of the mitochondrion. The more, the faster the mitochondrion is working, the more insulin that's getting into the mitochondrion, the more oxidative waste or the more free radicals the, the, these cells will produce. 
these free radicals tend to increase insulin resistance. So less insulin comes in. So the mitochondrion has effectively slowed down the reaction. It's a natural, it's a very natural feedback loop. We make free radicals. Free radicals are not necessarily bad things. We make free radicals, and our body actually uses it to, to control the rate of metabolism. Now, modern life has screwed us over in lots of different ways, and I'm sorry for my language, I apologize. Uh, but the oxidative stress that we live in, this production of superoxides and reactive oxygen uh, species and all of these things, is a lot worse in our modern day living than, it, than our body actually evolved into. So we tend to have a lot more oxidative load than our body is capable of dealing with, and that tends to worsen our insulin resistance. Worsening insulin resistance, demand for insulin, you get fatter. All right? And so what we've seen, this is to try and simplify and get past the chemistry of all of this. What we've seen, if you want to improve your insulin resistance, make yourself more sensitive to insulin, what we've noted is that if you're going to have a carb, try and make it a complex carb. If you're going to have fat, try and stay away from saturated fats. Stick to, you've heard terms like MUFA and PUFA, monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats. These unsaturated fats are kind of uh, important. Getting as much fiber as you can, whether, through its, uh, whether it's through an artificial source or a natural source, I tend to believe that natural fibers are probably more effective. All right, But getting more fiber in your diet definitely helps in, uh, improve insulin sensitivity. Moderate amounts of protein. We are in the middle of the biggest consumer boom of isolated protein the world has ever seen. Everybody's selling isolated protein now. And none of us are taking it the right way. We tend to take so much isolated protein in one shot that our insulin levels spike like crazy because there is no way to store protein in your body. If your body has too much protein at any given time, it's going to cut off that nitrogen, make a bunch of sugar, and spike your insulin levels. So a lot of people tend to replace their sugar with protein, and it doesn't necessarily work all that well. The other thing is, industrialized diets, we tend to be vitamin and mineral poor. Uh, getting vitamins in the form of vitamin B, in the form of trace minerals like zinc, selenium, magnesium, are very important. They reduce that oxidative stress that's uh, worsening our lives. We have seen uh, intermittent fasting be very, very effective in reducing uh, insulin resistance or improving insulin sensitivity. Getting regular exercise in terms of resistance exercise is also effective. And actually getting some sleep, improving both the quality and the quantity of sleep that you get, has an outsized... I, I put it last here, but by no means should you think that this has a small effect on insulin resistance. This has one of the largest effects on insulin resistance. So this is a, a by no means comprehensive list. Uh, moving on. So how do we measure insulin resistance? Now I've told you that there's this awesome test. How do we actually do it? It's not as easy as peeing on a keto stick or getting a keto uh, test. It is not as easy as a simple fasting blood sugar. And it's a little bit more expensive. So this tends not to be used by clinicians very easily. But that is changing slowly. So you have to get three tests done simultaneously, to actually be able to calculate your insulin resistance at any given time. You need a fasting blood sugar, you need a fasting insulin level where they actually quantify how much insulin's in your blood, then you need something called a C-reactive protein, which is this inflammatory marker that I won't bother you about too much. It's kind of related to that oxidative stress thing. You take these three numbers, you plug them into a, uh, to an algorithm that was designed uh, at Oxford, and you get a number. Now, this number is based on Western data in mo a majority Caucasian population, and this number tends to stay between 0 0.5 and 1.4 in that population of healthy people. So some authorities say that this, the number one, is the normal insulin resistance number. I have never seen the number one in any Indian, or in any Hispanic, or anything like that. So I don't really know if I can trust this number. I don't know what the normal number for Indians is. I have never seen an Indian with less than uh, insulin resistance of 2. And I have seen a couple of Indians walking around with an insulin resistance of 22. So, yeah, they were pretty sick, though. So, you know, we, we're not exactly sure. We haven't, we haven't gotten enough data to understand the biochemistry and derive these algorithms for the Indian population, but we are getting close. And uh, 
Finally, the experiment. So what we wanted to see was it's fairly intuitive to understand the relationship between eating carbs and your insulin resistance. The less the carbs, whether it's lower in terms of glycemic index or glycemic load, I'm not going to bother. The less the carbs, the better your insulin resistance or the better your insulin sensitivity. Well, what about fat? Thank you. Uh, what about fat? Uh, especially on a traditional ketogenic diet, we tend to eat uh, around 80, 85% fat. So how does fat, which theoretically should not spike your insulin levels, affect your insulin resistance? Does it affect it at all? So we took two groups. Uh, we took uh, a group one, 14 people. Now, uh, let me first say that this is an experiment. Uh, this is never going to be published in a journal. It does not stand up to that thing. The numbers are too small. Uh, the reporting is too inaccurate. This is basically for us to show that there's more research to be done here. It's worth doing more research in this field. So, uh, please don't pick apart my study. Um, so, protocol one, people on a traditional ketogenic diet, people were encouraged to eat between 1,500 and 2,000 calories a day, and their main job was to keep their carb count below 20 grams of carbohydrate a day. That was their main job. How they did it, their business. We didn't teach them. We didn't uh, influence their behavior. This was all self-reported data. And these guys are awesome. These 14 people, my Spartans, who actually wrote down what they were eating every single day, including midnight snacks and all of that kind of stuff. This is really, really... I know it's self-reported data, and I know that's not the best, but the fact that these people were interested enough over a three-month period to help me out with this data was incredibly... Uh, important. I'm grateful to them. So that's group one, your traditional keto group. What we saw was that your traditional ketoer would eat, on average, around 54 grams of saturated fat in a day. Now, I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm just giving you information. Saturated fat, by the way, is what you find in your meats, your cheeses, and your butters. Saturated fat, especially if you're doing a traditional ketogenic diet and you're non-vegetarian, saturated fat becomes easy to eat. It's in your chicken, it's in your bacon, it's in all the lard that you're eating, so it becomes very easy to eat that in large amounts. Um, in group two, we gave them a slightly different diet. We kept the calories the same. We gave them double or more carbohydrates. So we definitely didn't keep them in ketosis, but we, set, uh, we switched out all the, un, uh, all the saturated fat for unsaturated fat those pufas, those mufas, those olive oils, those flax seeds that people talk about so much, instead of giving them animal fat, we gave them vegetable fat in the, in the form of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids mostly. So that's where these pufas and mufas come, uh, come from. Now, I'm not going to bother you too much with the details here. This study was done over three months. Both groups were tested three times over three months. Initially, after one month on the diet, and then at the third month after they had been off the diet for two months, so we wanted to see what would happen after they went off the diet to their numbers. What we saw in group one in the traditional ketogenic diet is people lost a lot of weight. A 6% delta in your, in, in your weight in one month, that's a 100 kilo guy losing 6 kilos, that's a 70 kilo guy losing 4 kilos in a month, that's pretty good. All right? Uh, total body fat loss, 9% delta. Really, really, really good numbers. Insulin resistance, they, the average person in this group started at 4.7, they went down to 3.3. All right, so pretty good results, but they were on the keto diet for a month and then they were off of it for two months. And then what happened? They regained not all their weight, but most of it. They regained their fat, not all of it, but most of it. And their numbers slowly went back to what they were pre-intervention. Their, their numbers slowly went back to pre-intervention. Now, anyone who's... I've done a ketogenic diet several times. I've done different kinds of ketogenic diets. I've done ketogenic diets and lazy keto and all of that kind of stuff. So I know that the minute I stop this diet, it's going to snap back. The weight's going to come back as it has before. All right? So this is the first time I ever actually got to see this in numbers. And uh, group two, our low saturated fat group, they didn't lose as much weight in a month. But they kept it off, whatever they lost, even after being off the diet. They, didn't, they lost a lot of fat, actually, pretty comparable to group one. But they kept it off. They, their insulin scores were actually a lot worse to begin with because there were some, a lot of vegetarians in this group. They had massive responses that stayed after the third test. 
So what we saw is that in a diet, I don't want to be too glib and draw a lot of conclusions from there, but what we saw was that a diet in unsaturated fat seemed to be just as good, if not better, than a diet high in saturated fat when you're dealing with low carb and when you're dealing with people on ketogenic diets. So um, why do we think this is happening? Why do we see the results that we do? We believe it's due to the free radical bleed from normal metabolism. What your mitochondria are doing, that feedback loop that I talked about earlier, we believe that those free radicals are what are worsening your insulin resistance over time. When you eat a lot of saturated fat, those saturated fats don't have any uh, effect on the amount of free radicals that you make. They don't mop them up. They don't uh, get rid of them. They're totally independent. But unsaturated fats, those PUFAs, those MUFAs, those guys will actually attack free radicals on their own and decrease the load of free radicals at the receptor site over time. That's what we believe to be the process, or at least part of the process that's happening here. Uh, we need more studies and more time to really figure it out. So in a nutshell, what we think is happening is that a high saturated fat leads to oxidative stress, which leads to higher insulin resistance, which eventually leads to suffering in the dark side. So uh, if you want to take away anything from this diet, it's that we should really understand what we're trying to achieve on a diet. And when you embark on a particular diet, know how to measure yourself. Really look at how you're making your, uh, yourself uh, stay on the diet. It may not be a good idea to do ketone testing and blood sugar testing. It might be a better idea to get your insulin resistance done. Or it might be, uh, it really depends on uh, how you're going to look at the data and how, what, what kind of goals you're trying to achieve. So, uh, and we're also, we also believe that there's uh, been a lot of talk in circles over the last few years that saturated fats have made a comeback and that they're healthy and that there's no problem. We believe that there's a lot of scientific misinformation in that particular topic and we believe that saturated fats should still be kept to a minimum in any healthy diet. Okay, thank you. Questions? I just talked to you people to death. HOMA 2. HOMA 2. HOMA 2, yes. If you're using HOMA 2. Um, HOMA 2, the main recalibrations are basically what kind of plasma insulin they're using, the C-reactive peptide endpoints and, and things like that. It's a, it's a much better version than HOMA 1. But I went with that because of the fasting. The quickie and stuff like that I, don't, I haven't used. It doesn't require it, but the whole thing is we're looking at oxidative stress levels here. And CRP levels are a direct reflection of, uh, of that. Not a direct, or an indirect reflection. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Thank you for picking apart my study. It could be a lot of different stresses. It could be a lack of sleep. It could be a lot of that. It, it's not necessarily going to be the presence or absence of saturated fat. Absolutely. But over time, how much it will affect your insulin resistance is, in, is still to be studied. Uh, millimoles, five point, um, the, I'm sorry. Say because it. most of the insulin levels are actually calculated for insulinoma rather than for specifically for insulin resistance. Uh, there are a lot of uh, differences in the labs. So right. I just wanted to know what references so we you used, had. So uh, we used the Daily Apple lab right here in Bangalore, and they didn't do it for insulinomas. They did it for insulin. Because the insulinomas, the insulin values comes up to 22. Right. And that's it's a different data. It's a different data set that they're using yeah. for diseased patients rather that's than healthy what, patients. Because for insulin resistance as such, they have not brought it out in the public sense. True. Uh, I have a question. Um, so if saturated fats are bad, then can you still eat them? in moderation, because everybody likes to, and can well, yeah. you then add unsaturated fats to your diet and still live long? Absolutely. Uh, see, no, the thing is, let me not demonize any one particular type of food here. So even in the second diet protocol that we had, we did have a small amount of saturated fat. In normal cooking... That's really small. Yeah, it, in normal cooking, it's practically impossible to escape saturated fat entirely. So we kept it to the minimum that we could keep it to in this study design. 
But we don't know if adding a little bit more will affect IR, how much it will affect IR, and things like that. So all I can say at this point is that I know it's a good idea to keep it low. How low? I'm not sure. Aren't saturated fats, uh, fats less reactive than unsaturated ones? And um, they are, but indirectly they also stimulate the immune system to release certain cell adhesion molecules and different in inflammatory uh, kinins that uh, worsen reactive stress. Um, I think we'll have to wrap up questions now. We're running really late. Okay, last, last one. Sorry, there's more of a clarification. Oh, there. and one more thing about that. What we're saying is that the saturated fats do nothing to decrease the already existing buildup of reactive oxidative stress at the receptor site in between meals. So it's not that they're increasing uh, uh, inflammation, it's just that they're doing nothing to decrease it at the end. Uh, receptor site. Absolutely, but we got better numbers even though we weren't restricting uh, carbs to less than 20. We got it at 50. So we wanted to see what else we could do to get those numbers better without restricting carbs uh, uh, to a great extent because it damaged your biome and things like that. So I want to try and keep some grain in the meal. So 50 grams is what we wanted to keep it at. Mm. Right. Well, the grains that we have added still gave us lower insulin resistance numbers and better ROS. Uh, what we, we didn't measure ROS scores in, in there, but we imagine that the ROS scores would have been better. I need funding. Please let me do all this. <laughs> I, I really do. Uh, I'm sorry. We really need to stop now. We're running very, very late. Uh, just thanks a lot, Vinay. Thank you. Thank you.